Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And I feel the Holy Ghost. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now the next few verses talks about the devout men that had gathered under heaven there for that great feast day of Pentecost. They were confounded because as they gathered there to the, to the upper room, they were amazed. Verse 7, they marveled because these people were speaking in their own languages. And they were all Galileans. And then it goes through and names, languages, tongues that these 120 were preaching from the nations that they had never, ever, ever learned. But these folks knew, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, in Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabian. We hear them speak in our tongues, our languages, the wonderful works of God. They were amazed, verse 12. They were in doubt. They were saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking, listen. There's always going to be a mocker around. If a mocker can get you out of business, then check out now. There's always been, there will always be mockers. But there ain't going to be no mockers in heaven. And that's where we're going, by the grace of God. But others mocking said, ah, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up, with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But what's happening what you're seeing, all these people speaking in languages they never learned. This is that which was spoken, which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And what Joel said was, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants, and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I'm glad of all dispensations we are living in this dispensation of grace and for the truth of the Holy Ghost, and the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that the same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead does dwell in our bodies, and if you don't have the Holy Ghost tonight, He wants to give it to you, to raise you up to walk in newness of life. Let's pray and ask that God would help us tonight. Lord Jesus, we are exceedingly mindful of you and we're thankful to you for your word, for your ways, for your plan. And God, we stand amazed in your mercy that you've included us. We thank you, God. We want to sit at your feet. We want to learn. We want to receive. And God, we want to be part of everything you have in mind for your church to be and do. So we commit this service and our lives into your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. Certainly may be seated, of course. 
Now we're going to end up in, in I think, some wonderful waters. But before we get there, with I feel the purpose of God that he has placed in my heart, there's some things and points I want to make. As I do this, there may be some to say that, well, we know that. And what would be interesting would be after I got done, if people would be honest to say how many did not know that. And if one person among us does not know that, then it's worth all of us listening to it again to make sure everybody, by the grace of God, gets it. And if you will think of those that perhaps do not know that, and you may know that, if that was your child that perhaps does not know that, then you would say thank you. I want my children to get this. The bottom line is that we are now in the last days, saith God, and he said in those last days he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. What this means is that from that day of Pentecost forward, the spirit of God was no longer simply relegated to the nation of Israel that had been given the laws, the commandments, the promises but now God was going to move beyond their social, cultural, and land borders, and he was going to begin to move in every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. It did not matter if you were Jewish or not. He wants to pour out the Holy Ghost in your world. And he said this gospel would be preached in every nation, and then would the end come. So this is why endeavors are being made from one God, Jesus' name, apostolic peoples throughout this world to get this gospel into every nation and by the grace of God into every heart. And so now, as that took place on the day of Pentecost, we can receive the exact same blessing that they did on that day. When Peter preached to them about continuing about the death, burial, and resurrection and how that, how that the Jews had with wicked hands turned Simon or turned Jesus to Pontius Pilate who determined to let him go but the vice of pressure, political pressure was placed on him and, and, and Jesus was therefore crucified and therefore his innocent blood was upon all these men who were stabbed, pricked in their hearts. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? His answer to the dilemma of what does a lost person do that is guilty because of any sin, amen, how do they get this rectified? His answer is the same today as it was then. Then Peter said unto them, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he didn't stop there. For the promise is unto you and to your children, and he didn't stop there, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So here we are 2,000 years later, Amen. On the other side of the world, and the promise is still the same because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He's the Lord, and he does not change. And if you will find a place of repentance, if you have not yet done so, and you will be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not done so, Amen. Your sins will be washed away. You will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You'll know you'll have it. Because you will begin, as they did, to speak in a language you never learned before. Amen. And that is God's initial evidence that you are signed, that you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And as it has its way in your life, further evidence is manifest by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, uh, temperance. 
Amen. And, and, and you go and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. But you get started by receiving the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is not the end of the matter. That's the beginning. Praise God. That's the beginning. That's where it starts. Praise the Lord. Now, when people receive the Holy Ghost, they speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. This takes place, and Jesus said it would take place. The prophet said it would place, take place. In, and Brother Adam's going to do some little bit of reading here. He said, boy, this is really like Bible study. It is, praise God. Isaiah 28, read verses 11 and 12. For with stammering lips. For with stammering lips. And another tongue. Ah, and another tongue. Will he speak to this people? Will he speak to this people? To whom he said. To whom he saith. This is the rest. This, this, this. The stammering lips, lips part, it's exactly the way I got it. I, I would start to speak in another language. I would stop. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And he'd get, he get started down in my lips. We start just stuttering. And I'd stop. Praise the Lord. And finally, somebody got in my ear and said, don't resist the Holy Ghost. When he starts to speak, let him flow. It doesn't matter what it sounds like. And it was no more stammering lips. It was another tongue. Hallelujah. And that was God telling me, this is the rest wherewith he causes the weary to rest. This is the refreshing. Hallelujah. Yet they would not hear. Yet there are people that will not hear. They will not hear. There's people that don't want to hear that. But I'm glad by the mercies of God we can hear it. And more importantly, we can receive it. Praise God. Jesus said in the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 16 and 17. He that believeth that is baptized. And I'm going to stop right here. If by any chance you happen to have a Bible that says this is not found in the original text. <clears throat> they're mistaken. Because there are scriptures older than those texts of which they're speaking of the Alexandrian text. There are, there are scriptures much older than that from Syria. They got every word in there. Every word. Let me take, God takes care of his Bible, okay? All is well. Hallelujah. So Mark 16, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized. He that believeth and is baptized. Shall be saved. Shall be saved. And some of the earliest church fathers quote these verses. But he, Read. But he that believeth not shall be damned. But he that does not believe will be damned. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not will be damned. Well, if he doesn't believe, he's not going to be getting baptized. Okay? Read. And these signs shall follow them that believe. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. In my name. Shall they cast out devils. They will cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall speak with with new tongues. And on the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, they were gathered together in one place in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Amen. This is why also in the book of Acts chapter 8, they were baptized, those of Samaria, in verse 12 and verse 16, in Jesus' name, yet they knew they did not have the Holy Ghost, Philip calls the apostles John and Simon Peter. They lay hands on them, and when they did, they received the Holy Ghost. And one Simon bar Jesus that was watching this, who had formerly bewitched the people through sorceries, in the word there's pharmaceutos, probably through drugs, and drugs and witchcraft always go hand in hand. And, and, and so he bewitched the people that he was the great power of God. Now he's been stripped clean. He know, they know he's not. He's now seeing something happen that he's willing to pay money for because they knew they didn't have the Holy Ghost. How did they know they didn't have the Holy Ghost? The Bible said there was great joy in that city. The Bible said they had repented. The Bible said they were baptized in Jesus' name, but they had not as yet received the Holy Ghost. Well, how did they know? 
There was something missing. There was something lacking. When the apostles laid hands on them, something happened, and they knew they got it, and it was worth uh, uh, this Margie's character, or Simon the sorcerer, to pay money for that. And they said, your money perish with you. Your heart's not right with God. So something happened. Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost? How did they know they got it? They spoke in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. People said, what is this? Simon said, that is the infilling of the Holy Ghost that Joel prophesied about. He's pouring out his Spirit. Then in Acts chapter 10, there's a man named Cornelius. He's a devout man. He is so devout, his prayers have built a memorial in heaven. He's not baptized in Jesus' name. He does not yet have the Holy Ghost. Listen to me. To say that people that have not as yet received this have zero zilch attention of God is silly. God paid so much attention to Cornelius. His prayers built something in heaven. But if that's all he needed, he'd have been left alone. He needed more than just a prayer life. This is why God spoke to Simon and he said, there's guys coming to get you. Go with them. Don't doubt anything. In spite of the fact that they're Gentiles. To which Simon was like, And so here they come because Cornelius had had a vision and the angel of the Lord said, Arise, send men to Joppa. Go to the one Simon the Tanner's house. They're going to find a man named Simon Peter. Get him. Bring him here. He's going to tell you what you need to do. And so while Simon is there, here's these Gentiles. He can't believe it. There are six other Jews with him. they like, ooh, we don't even want to be around these characters. And, 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 and so he's had the vision. He knows. Cornelius has had a vision. He knows. And so he says, tell me what you know. Simon Peter says, Jesus was crucified. He rose. He preaches the death, burial, resurrection. Amen. While he's preaching that message, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Amen. And they of the circumcision were astonished. Those Jews that were with Simon, they were blown away because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's how they knew they got it. They heard him. If Cornelius would have said, Simon, Simon, stop. Look at this smile on my face. I just received the Spirit. Those Jews that were with him would have said, let's get out of here. But they were astonished because they weren't just grinning. They were speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. They were being filled, and they were astonished. And that's when Simon Peter turned and said, any of you boys big enough to forbid that these should be baptized as well as we who've received the Holy Ghost like we did? And he baptized them, commanding them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So this God, this God is good. This God is big. And just quickly, Acts 19, he finds, Paul finds certain disciples. He said, now, now, you, 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 you got the Holy Ghost? And they said, well, well, we don't even know what the Holy Ghost is. He said, how were you baptized? Well, we were baptized unto John the Baptist baptism. Well, you're going to have to be rebaptized. Because John spoke of him that was to come, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul laid hands on them, and they spoke with tongues. Hallelujah. Can I tell you, anywhere in the New Testament, somebody receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, something happens, and what happens is what Jesus said would happen, and what Isaiah said would happen, they will speak with new tongues. Hallelujah. And this is the Spirit of God. God, saying this is the rest wherewith he causes the weary to rest. So when you speak in tongues for the first time in your life, you got the Holy Ghost. You got the Holy Ghost. 
Now, after that, and I'm moving on, but after that, when you speak in tongues again, there are different things happening than the initial evidence that you receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. One of these uh, can be that you are um, building yourself up in personal edification. Read in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 and 15. For if I pray in an unknown tongue. This is the apostle Paul. Now he's talking to the Corinthian church. These people all have the Holy Ghost. And he said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. But speaking in tongues also has other purposes than the initial sign that you got the Holy Ghost. For if I pray in an unknown tongue. I'm now praying in an unknown tongue. I've been praying in Aramaic. I've been praying in Hebrew. Or I've been praying in English. And now I'm praying, but I don't know what I'm saying. It's another language that I'm speaking. My spirit prayeth. My spirit is praying. My Holy Ghost, my spirit is praying. But my understanding is unfruitful. But I don't know what I'm praying about. What is it then? What is it then? I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the spirit, not knowing what I'm talking about. And I will pray with understanding also. And I will also pray, in my case, in English. I'll pray in English, but I'll pray in other tongues. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing in the Spirit songs in the Holy Ghost. I don't know what I'm saying. And I've done that many times, many, many, many times. I love it. I love it. And I will sing with understanding also. And I will sing knowing what I'm saying. It doesn't matter. Let her go. I'm going to stop here and make a statement. I think it's important. Uh, well, let me come back to that. If I, if I miss that, somebody else. Sister Booker! So don't let me forget. All right? Okay. Another thing we do is in Jude 20. But ye we're praying. beloved. But ye beloved. Building up yourselves. Building up yourself. On your most holy faith. On your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy praying Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. So we're praying in other tongues. We're building up ourselves, praying in the Holy Ghost, in our most holy faith. Now, here we go about Brenda Booker. When I hadn't been in church all that long, um, I got the Holy Ghost April 6th, 1972. January 20th, 73. Uh, Brenda Lang and I were married. Okay? And, and her pastor was worried because I'd been a hippie and been so bad. My pastor was worried. I'm, not, I'm just telling you. He'd tell you. Because... He said, I was growing so fast and coming on like gangbusters. He was, he was a little worried that Sister Booker would, would hold me back. And he loved her. He really wanted me to marry her. Okay? But that's, that's, that's what he said. But she actually helped me. I could have easily become a spiritual idiot. <laughs> she helped me keep my feet on the ground. But I remember... We'd be praying in church or praying by the bed at night, praying in our living room, praying. And I'm going to tell you something that really made me mad. I mean, I didn't. I would have a problem speaking in tongues. Okay? When I got the Holy Ghost, it was like a rushing mighty wind. <laughs> Man, I was just ripping and roaring. Okay? And then a few weeks later, I went to my very first fellowship meeting. And I went down to the altar, and I spoke in tongues again. And it was, I mean, it was rolling like a, like a freight train. Okay? So I had it in my mind that if you were going to speak in tongues, you had to be so captivated that almost you didn't have a choice. You're just, you're, your tongue was like a flag Flapping in the breeze with a Santa Ana wind blowing. 
So I would go days and days and not speak in tongues. I'd kneel down to pray, and she, in just a couple, sometimes matters of seconds, she's speaking in tongues. And I'm waiting for this rushing mighty wind to knock me off my feet. And finally, I said, hey, 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 I got a question. What? How can you speak in tongues so easy? I, I have a hard time. I can't do that. How do you do that so easy? And I knew, I mean, it was the real deal. I could feel it and tell it. And she said, and it changed me. She said, well, for one thing, I've had the Holy Ghost since I was 10. And I've learned what he feels like. And he doesn't, um, this, is my, this is what I got. She said, I don't have to be knocked off my feet to speak in tongues. I can feel him. And, uh, and I can let go easily. And you're trying and holding on and waiting or whatever until it just... <laughs> and... And then I, years, many years later, and by that time, I'd, I learned to loosen up. But I remember sitting in a house where there was a, a man asking Brother I.H. Terry the same question. He said, Brother Terry, I just have a hard time breaking through speaking in tongues. And Brother Terry brought out a hanky. He said, now, son, it's like this. He said, on the day of Pentecost, and he had a hanky, but he said, it was like a rushing mighty wind And they, they got it. He said, now, that's a rushing mighty wind. Does the wind blowing, if it's blowing five miles an hour? Yes. It can be, or it can be. He said, so sometimes it's like, and other times it's like, but said it still affects. You don't think it's affecting you unless it knocks you off your feet. You need to learn to just let it touch you. Well, basically, that's what my wife told me. And it took me a while to loosen up and realize that he doesn't have to knock me in the head. It's like this, folks. Put this analogy on it. If the only time you get your kids to do anything, I said move! And that's the only thing they respond to. That's not cool. But if you can all say, hey, man, listen, would you do thus and so? Yeah. And you don't have to scream. You just, that's cool too. You got it? If you scream, get out of the street! And boom. That's good. But it's also good, listen, I see your truck out there. We're going to stand on the corner. Is there any cars coming? All right. Quickly, no car. Look, go fetch the truck. Okay? You can teach lessons different ways. The Holy Ghost is the same way. Yeah. It's a rushing mighty wind, but it can be a gentle, sweet breeze. He can speak softly and gently. This is why in the Song of Solomon, amen, he spoke. And, and, or, or rather, in Elijah's day, there was an earthquake. But, you know, God wasn't in that earthquake. And there was a mighty wind, but God wasn't there. But then there was the still, small voice of God. He had developed a sensitivity. Okay. So there's a praying in the Holy Ghost. I just thought I'd stop here and tell you. Learn to trust him. Learn to yield to him and let him work with you. Then there's the third thing, and that is when God uses tongues for the purposes of the gifts of the Spirit, of which there are nine. So in, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, read verse 10. To another, the working of miracles. There can be the Spirit of the Lord move on somebody to work a miracle. To another, prophecy. God can move on another to give a prophetic utterance. To another, discerning of spirits. God can move on another for discerning 
of spirits. And if you notice here, where it says discerning of spirits, literally, and I'm not, I don't play Greek games, but that word in the Greek is with an S on it. It means it's plural, discernings of spirits. And that doesn't mean that you discern that everything is an evil spirit or the kind of evil spirit, but you can also have discernings. Is this, ah, that's the spirit of God. You can discern, you know, that's a human spirit. You can discern that's an evil spirit. It's discernings. But the spirit helps you discern those things. There is no such thing as the gift of discernment. The spooky people that I have the gift of discernment. There is no such thing. If the Holy Ghost decides to move and give discernings of spirits, that's his business at his, at his bidding. Can I, take, can I stop here and tell you there has to always be something in us that says, Jesus, it's not me, it's you. There has to always be there. Uh, I heard a while back... And some of you have heard of a man by the name of William Branham. But back in the 40s, late 40s, 50s, and early 60s, and uh, this man literally, I know people that knew him personally. I know several people that knew him personally. I know people that worked with him personally. Had him in their churches. He believed one God, Jesus' name, apostolic, Holy Ghost, holiness, message. He believed it just like us, exactly. And uh, literally tens of thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of people were healed across America. He had an unbelievable, powerful healing ministry. I mean, it was, it was mind-boggling. Sometimes you've heard me talk about old brother Williams, that that man said, do you feel, the, to this lady, do you feel the presence of a large angel behind you? And she said, yes, and old brother Williams couldn't see an angel and he prayed and he said he saw literally thousands of angels in that auditorium only time in his life he'd ever seen angels and William Branham prayed for her and he fainted and she fainted but she was healed and then after that that was his first major uh, crusade whereby he became nationally known with crusades all over America and it was in Phoenix with brother outlaw in Phoenix back many many years ago he preached at brother, uh, old brother Pop Williams' church. Gary Howard was there. He was a little boy. And he stood up and had never been there before, didn't know anybody, and went to the pulpit. And he said, and there was a woman in the church. Her husband had been, in, he'd been bed fast, basically, for six years, bed fast. He got up and he said, called her name, Sister So-and-So, could you stand? She stood said, you need to go home. God's just healed your husband. He's walking around the house worshiping God, and he's really wanting to see you. She screamed, grabbed her purse, drove home rather speedily, walked in. He's walking around the house worshiping God. He'd been healed instantly. And many, like, I, I, I could tell you stories all day long, people that I knew personally that knew him. One of the men that knew him, but I didn't know that man, um, was a Brother Dunn. Brother Dunn used to work with him. Brother Dunn believed and loved this message to the core of his soul. It was in him deep. And uh, he just died a couple of years ago. He was an old, 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 old man. But he would do, he would, he would preach messages in front of, of William Branham. And, uh, and he'd preach the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And he said he would travel with William Branham, and he said many a night, many, many, many a night as he traveled with him, and he was, he was becoming known, and so many miracles were happening. He said late into the night, and sometimes early in the morning, he would hear William Branham rolling in the room, up above him, rolling. And he would roll and roll and said, it's not me, God! It's not me, God, it's not me, it's you, it's you, God, you're the healer, you're the healer, God, it's not me, it's you, it's you're the healer. And because he traveled with him for so long, people said, when did he start going bad? 
and he did. He, he got into deep false doctrine, very deep, very deep, very sad false doctrine. He drew followers after him. When he died, these followers waited for three days. They thought he was going to rise again from the dead, but he didn't. I met his son. I met William Brennan's son. Talked to him for a couple hours. Be that as it may, he said he began to change when he quit rolling. He said, I began to notice he was no longer rolling on the floor saying, it's not me, it's not me, God, it's you, it's not me. And he said when he quit rolling is when he began to change. You hear me? It ain't us, folks. It's him. It's him. It's him. It's him. And it doesn't matter if it's miracles. It doesn't matter if it's gifts of the Spirit. It doesn't matter if it's preaching, teaching, singing. It doesn't matter what it is. It's not me, God! It's you. It's you. It's you. Okay? So, in this third grouping, though, there are times that God will use someone in tongues that are given, that are meant to be interpreted. And the only thing I can say is that when that takes place, and it's, it's, it's how do you define it? I don't know, but it's, it's where all of a sudden there is a message, there is a, someone speaking in tongues that cuts through yeah. like like a freight train, it's up on end, it commands, demands attention. And oftentimes, I have seen, oftentimes, that before that happens, all of a sudden, shoo. I've watched this many times. It doesn't happen every time, but I've seen it several times. It's instant silence, and then somebody whoo, will give a message in tongues. Then, those tongues are meant to be interpreted. And the interpreter can be the person that gave the message. That's why the Bible says, if you give, a, give that message in tongues, basically, pray that you may interpret. That God will give you the interpretation. But others may receive the interpretation. Okay? And those are one of the gifts of the Spirit. And I will tell you that we need to see more of that. It needs to happen here more than what it does. And I believe God wants it to. And I believe that he will. And if, you've, if you have felt something, and, 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 and how do you describe something like that? But this, let me just give you my, term, my verbiage because I've talked to a lot of people, but is, um, is if, if, it's, if you feel like, you know, you get a bottle of pop, that carbonated water, and it gets shook up, and you got your thumb on it, and you can feel the pressure on the thumb, and you just, it just, it's just and you move your thumb, and psh, the best way I can describe it, and this is just terminology, is there's a message building on you, and it just, you just, and he just, psh. that's where I can describe it. That can also happen in the interpretation. Though also remember, it states him that prophesy, let him prophesy by faith. There is nothing we do in the kingdom of God that you don't need the element of faith. Including giving a message in tongues or giving the interpretation. It all requires faith. So having just said that, you have the initial infilling of speaking in other tongues as that initial sign you receive the Holy Ghost. You also have times that you're building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. And then there are times that he will use tongues as one of the gifts of the Spirit that are meant to be interpreted. And there are, there's, a, there's a lot about that, but we're not going to get into that right now. 
okay? But be open, be prayerful, and if God moves on you, don't, 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 just, just, just obey him. Just, you know, don't worry about it. He said, well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid if I do, I'll kind of falter and I'll get in a mess. Well, Simon Peter walked on the water, dude. He got a little shook up and he started to sink, but Jesus walked him back to the boat. But he did something nobody else did. And God knows how to do it. Just trust him. Just trust him. Okay. Now, having said that, those are the three main areas. Tongues, initial evidence. Tongues, building up yourself. Tongues, meant to be interpreted. And having made the statement that I did about the gifts of the Spirit, I want to talk to us some more about building up yourself in that most holy faith. Trusting it. Praying. Letting God have his way. Can I tell you something? This is a Pentecostal church. And we are Pentecostal people. And there needs to be something in us that says, God, you don't have to knock me off my feet. I want to be a tongue talker. I want to pray in that most holy faith. I really do want to build myself up. I want, I, want, I want you to have your way in my life. There are things and times that God moves and does what he means to do. This is why in, and I'm just going to read this, 1 Corinthians 12, he says, you are the body of Christ, your members in particular. God has set some in the church, apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And that's what he's talking about. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? They do initially, but when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, and that's all that he's talking about in that realm, do all interpret, he goes on. Not everybody gives a message meant to be interpreted. Not everybody gives a message or gives the interpretation. But everybody needs to build up their most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. And yes, I will stop and make this statement. There are times in my Holy Ghost walk when I would ten times rather, and I've asked God, God, you know I love speaking in tongues and let me speak in tongues. But Jesus, I would love a good washing out with tears. I want you to wash me out from the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Let me have a crying jag and wash me clean through tears. Now you can speak in tongues while you're crying. But just God breaking you down and having his way. But this is my statement to you. Let God have his way in your world. Let God have his way in your life. As I look back through my life, I think of moments and times in the road that if it hadn't have been for these kinds of things, I don't know what I'd do. I don't know where I'd be. God knows what he's doing, how to do it, when and where to do it, he knows how. There are times, and, I, and I'm not going to, there's so many I could give, and some of them I have. Of, 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 I will tell you this, in my, in my first church, and I'm, I'd been there about six weeks, this is just a moment that stands out in my mind. And some of you have heard this more than once, but the full import of it. And maybe it's hitting me so hard lately now because Sister Chenault is gone. But I was in a, we were in a service and a message in tongues went forth and there was a visiting preacher there. This is the only time this has ever happened in my life. I knew for a fact in my spirit, I knew that man had the interpretation. I mean, it's like, it's like his face was like, but I knew he had it, but he wasn't giving it. 
And uh, so we waited. I said, let's wait on the Lord. Let's wait on the Lord. We waited. Nothing happened. So we went on with song service. And I went and sat down. And, 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 and this, this minister, he slipped out. And he came down. And he sat next to me. And he said, Pastor Booker. And I said, yes. He said, I had the interpretation. But I didn't give it because it was to you personally and not to the church. But I had it. I have it. And, and I knew he had it. I mean, the Holy Ghost showed me he had it. But I also knew he gave the message in tongues publicly. And so I'm debating on this. And he said, he said I can give the interpretation if you'd like publicly. This is weird. I, I said, well, the tongues were public. So after the song, I got up and I basically told him what I just told you. I said, so brother, come up. And he said, let's all stand. He said, I can't just do this. He said, that, he said we need to pray. And if that same presence of God comes back in like it was, I'll be able to give it. But we need that same presence so we stood, we began praying, and in just a couple of seconds, it was there. <sighs> and he gave the interpretation, and I could almost quote it to you right now. But the bottom line, I know I could, in fact, 90% of it. And he let me know some things he was very pleased with. But he said, you're going to lose that for which I've anointed you. But if you'll humble yourself and walk with me, I will restore you to that former place. And I began to go, within 30 days, I began to go through a trial. I, I, I figured they was telling me there was a trial coming. I thought the trial might be a week, two, three weeks or something. It was a three-year trial. It's three of the hardest years of my life. But I thank God for those years. I wouldn't take anything for them, but I don't want to go through them again three of the hardest years of my life it's when I found out exactly what I believed it's when I found out uh, what this was about it's when I had to fight for everything that I have and am and Joel will tell you I, I, he told the preacher the other day we were driving down the road and he was in the back seat talking and he said my earliest years the earliest memories I've got is watching my father lay on the floor of the church and pray and cry. Well, after this three-year time, Brother and Sister Chenault came. Brother Chenault preached. When he got done, I went to the pulpit, and I went to make a few words. And when I did, I gave a cry in tongues. I mean, it, just, it flowed out of me. And, and, and I waited for the interpretation but it felt a little different. But I, I, I waited, and so I said, let's move on. So after service, we go to the house, and it's 10 o'clock, and Brother Chenault's sitting in a chair, and he's nodding off. He's, he's going to sleep. And Sister Chenault brought a footstool up close to me, and she said, I had the interpretation for that message in tongues, but I didn't give it publicly because it was to you personally and not to the church. And when she said that, I could literally, literally feel the hair stand up on the back of my head. I said, really? She said, yes. Would you like me to tell you what it was? What are you going to say? No, I'm not interested. <laughs> I said, yes. And she said, it's, it, is, it is scripture. Um. Go to Isaiah 55. Go to the last five verses of chapter 55. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven. I've been preaching my heart out. But as the rain comes down, the snow from heaven. It returneth not hither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. 
So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, shall not return unto me void. The word is not going to come back void. But it shall accomplish it that which I please. It will accomplish that which I please. It shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent It'll it. It will prosper where I send it. For ye shall go out with joy. And when she read that part, I knew I was leaving Miami. I knew it. You shall go out with joy. Be led forth with peace. You'll be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in the singing. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you into and singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their all hands. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up with fir Instead tree. of these thorns you've been eating for three years. Come up the fir tree. There's going to come up a fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Instead of the briar is going to come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting and sign. And at that moment, I sat and wept like a baby because I knew by the mercies of God there's a future and God's going to help us and we're going to have revival someplace, somewhere, sometime. And he brought us to California. Now, what is that worth to you? What is it worth? If it, it, what was it worth when one night in a service and there was a man that was struggling and, and he'd received the Holy Ghost, but he'd, he, he was in a church where there was so much negativity and, and they, they made fun of so much. Literally, I hate to tell you this, but they did. And, they, and, and so he was, he was skeptical of tongues and interpretation. He was skeptical of the gifts of the Spirit. This was a one-God church. He picked up that attitude. And, and so, but he had spent time in Thailand during the Vietnam War and he picked up the Thailandese language. And so one night he was sitting in the back and, and, and my wife, the Holy Ghost got to moving, and my wife gave a powerful message in tongues. This don't happen every day, obviously. And the Holy Ghost gave me the interpretation, and I gave the interpretation. And he'd come up and grab my coat, sobbing like a baby. And he said, your wife was speaking perfect Thailandese. I knew exactly what she was saying, and I know your wife don't know Thailandese. And he said, I was waiting to see what was going to be said, and said, you gave the exact interpretation of what she said. And he hugged me like a baby and wept and said, now I know it's true. Now I know it's true. Now I know it's true. There's got to be something in us that catches the revelations of what God wants to do. And I want this church to be an apostolic, one God, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost, Holiness Church. I want the Spirit of God to be able to move. I want, I want, I want hearts and lives and souls to be changed. Because the world doesn't have the answers. People need to feel and find God. They need to experience God. And we're in the last of the last days, and I'm here to tell you, God, I just feel like he's fixing to roll up his sleeves and say, you watch me work if you'll just give me a chance. You watch and see what I'll do if you'll just work with me. So pray and keep on praying. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. My God's got his hand on the door and he is fixing to open. I was talking to Brother Nathaniel Urshan. And we were talking about his stories about his grandpa. I knew stories about his grandpa he was not aware of. And obviously he knew stories that I was not aware of. And uh, he said when he was a little boy, he remembered his great, not his grandfather, his great-grandfather, Andrew Urshan. Now, Andrew Urshan is... Uh, there are people in Russia today, they're called Urshanites. And Brother Trailer has told me he has met people that are Urshanites. And, and because they have not received teaching, so very, very little teaching down through the many, many decades since Andrew Urshan was there, in some things they've got funny. But, but Brother, Brother Nathaniel Paul told me, he said, Brother Booker, I preached in Russia. I went into a little church. They were Urshanites. And there was a picture of my great-grandfather on the wall when he was a young man. And uh, 
He said, do you have any idea what that felt like to me? Well, back when he was preaching, when Andrew Urshan was preaching in Russia, it was before the Bolshevik Revolution. And it was, it was World War I started in 1914, and he was there in 1915. And so they were, they were, they were in the First World War. And, uh, and the czarist regime was still there. And so the Greek Orthodox Church was still the main power to be reckoned with religiously. It's pretty interesting that when Mr. Putin has come into power, the only recognized church that they put their thumb of approval on at all is the Greek Orthodox Church because he wants the people's goodwill to help him pull off his regime. Be all that as it may, Andrew Urshan goes in there and by that time he's got the revelation of the one mighty God in Christ and he's preaching baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So there are people that are being baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost and they're called Urshanites. Urshanites. And, 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 and his grandfather, not his great-grandfather, when his grandfather, when they were involved in getting the Siberian 7 out, one of the, one of the men that was giving him a hard time, he said, there are more Urshanites than there are grasshoppers in Russia. Okay? Be that as it may. He got in trouble with the czarist regime. He said, I heard my grandpa tell this more than once. He said, you want to hear about, and he, had a, he was a Persian, strong Persian accent. You want to hear about Mishak, Sarrak, and Abednego in the fiery furnace? This is greater. You want to hear about Daniel in the lion's den? This is greater. Because this is me. They were going to shoot Andrew Urshan. The firing squad was there. Six men with rifles for preaching non-Greek Orthodox doctrine to Russian peoples. And so he was up against the wall. Andrew Urshan did not know Russian. So he did all of his preaching through an interpreter. He would preach Aramaic. He knew Persian, Aramaic, and then English. And so this man knew Aramaic and Russian. So he would preach through this man. So he didn't know Russian, so they're going to shoot him, and the translator is obviously off to the side. He don't want the bullets to get him. And, uh, and he said, the man wants to know if you have a last request. He said, yes, I have a last request. Ask them if they'll allow me to pray. And they said, yes, you can pray. So here's Andrew Urshan. He's up against the wall. They've got their guns cocked. They're ready. And he begins to pray. And I've heard his son Nathaniel say that by the time he prayed for over the breakfast, the food would be cold. And 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 many he was just he was he was just he was just like that. He would pray in a restaurant and stand up and pray out loud. And and, and Nathan Urshan said he would just oh. Oh, Dad. Oh, Dad. Said one time he was in a restaurant, and this restaurant, they had this, this little traveling violin people walking around playing, and they began to play Danny Boy. Danny Boy's an Irish song. But it was, it was uh, Clifford. Anyway, he was up in Oregon. I'll think of it. And, and, and he... Booth Cliburn, William Booth Cliburn. Booth Cliburn from the Salvation Army was his grandpa. So here's Booth Cliburn. He writes a song to that. Instead of Danny boy, the eyes of Ireland are upon you. Andrew Urshan stood up to the accompanying violins. says, I'm not my own. The Lord has bought and paid. For me. And he's singing. What's the name of that song? He saw my faults. He looked beyond my fault. And he sang the whole thing. And the whole restaurant clapped. That was his grandpa. That was his great grandpa. And meanwhile, his son is like, oh, dad. So anyway, 
He's up against the wall, the firing squad. Yes, you can pray. He's going to have a good long prayer meeting. And he begins to pray and pray and pray. And then he begins speaking in tongues. And he's speaking in tongues powerfully. And he prays a long time. And there's rifles on the ground. And the guys are gone. And the interpreter said, I didn't know you knew Russian. He said, I don't know Russian. He said, you just prayed for 15 minutes in perfect Russian. He said, what did I say? He said, well, among other things, about the time they dropped the guns was, I have a company of angels round about you. And if you harm my prophet, I will slay every one of you. That's when they dropped the guns and took off. Can I tell you, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is our God in the 21st century. We're the people that are going to see the coming of the Lord, I believe. You can stand. Heard a story. An old brother Kilgore's church before he moved into the new building. It's over in a rough part of town. We moved years ago. That was a great church. Bottom line. Back in World War I again. Poor Poland. If it wasn't the Austrian troops coming through pillaging, it was the German troops coming through pillaging. Sometimes the English would come through, sometimes. The troops and the Germans and the Austrians could be so rough. And there was a little village. And there was a boy. And there was older brothers. And, and they could see the troops. Houses were being put on fire. Guns were being shot. Children ran. This little boy, he didn't know what to do. And the soldiers were coming and she wrapped him in a coat, a heavy coat, shoved him out the little back door and said, Run! Run! Don't stop! Run! Run! And he said while he was running out the back door, he could hear him kicking in the front door. And he's running! And he's running and he's listening to his mother's screams. And he runs into the woods. He's hiding and he's fearful. Any noise, he runs again. He runs. And he doesn't realize how far he's ran. And he hits a bank. And he slides off down. It was winter time. And it was night. And he slides into icy cold waters of a river swollen due to the bad weather. And there are uprooted trees going, spinning, turning because of the waves, and the river was a torrent. And he's got his heavy coat, and he's in the freezing water, and he gets caught in branches of a tree, and the tree starts spinning, and it pulls him under, and he's swallowing water, and he's freezing and he knows he's dying and he said so this is what it feels like to die in his mind and then he said all of a sudden he felt something he was no longer cold he was he was he was warm and, 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 and he was still in the water, 
But he, it was the oddest feeling. He thought, well, I guess this is what death feels like. And he felt something grab him by the coat and jerk him loose of the trees. And he came up and he got a breath. <coughs> He's spitting out water. And when he comes to, he's on the bank. And he's cold now. And he's so frightened because there's a man looking at him, staring him in the face. But it's a Polish farmer looking at a poor little boy. And he picks him up. And he takes him to his home and they're all poor, but he makes room for him. And he raises that little boy. He learns farming. He becomes a man. He marries. He farms. It's, it's tenant farming, but it's what he does. He has children. His children have children. They're all getting older. He's getting older. It's harder and harder to farm of necessities, having to make it smaller. Kids are marrying, kids are moving, kids are doing. And his wife dies. He's basically alone. He's got friends in the village and kids come every now and then and see him. But he has a granddaughter that somehow made it over to America. And she met an American boy. And they fell in love. They were married. And then he moved to Houston, Texas. And while in Houston, Texas, he got in church at Life Tabernacle. They received the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in Jesus' name. And they're living for Jesus. And one day, the old Polish man in, in Poland, he's, he's, he's broaching 80 now. He gets a letter from his granddaughter. Why don't you come to America? Come and live with us. We'll help you. We'll work it on our end. You just do this and that. We'll take care of the finance. Grandpa, come live with me. And he's loath to do so, but after a while. So they go through all the hoops and the little jigs and dances, and he gets to America, and she's there waiting. Drives across this big, vast country, goes to Houston, Texas. He cannot speak a word of English. He can't speak a word of English. She keeps asking him to come to church. And he's not been much of a church goer. He's not against it, not for it. He just so he puts her off for a while and she keeps pleading. Finally he says, Oh, she's been so good to me. I've got to go. So he goes and he sits in the far back. And it was just one of those nights. When the Holy Ghost swept in, and people are responding, people are worshiping, some are running the aisles and moving around, and he's never seen anything like this in his life. And he frankly does not like it, thank you. And he's, and he's, and he's thinking, I'm fixing to get out of here. I, th I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... I'm going to go sit in the car. I have to get the keys, whatever I got to do. But I'm getting out of here. I'm going to sit in the car. And he said as he was about to get up, he started feeling this, this something, this warm feeling come on him. And instantly he said, what is this? I have felt this before. What is this? And a man is behind him staggering. And he stops. 
And he starts speaking in other tongues. In perfect Polish. I'm the one that pulled you loose of the tree and out of the river and to the river bank. I'm the one that sent the man to take you home and raise you. And I'm the one, he's hearing this in Polish, and I'm the one that brought you to this country, and I'm the one that brought you to this church tonight. And I brought you here to save you, if you'll just let me. And that warm feeling was on him. And God had saved his life as a little boy from marauding armies. And he made his way down front through the help of his granddaughter. He poured out his soul and God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And before the night was over, he was under the water again, but this time just momentarily in the name of Jesus for the remission of his sins, and he came out. And he's been gone many years now, but he died in the truth. That God's in this house tonight. That God's in the Inland Empire. That God knows where people are. That about our world that God knows who they are where they are that God knows if this church will just be what God wants it to be he'll do what he wants to do anybody want to go into the waters deeper and say Jesus all I can say is count me in whatever you've got planned for the Inland Empire I want to be part of it. Whatever you've got in mind in my life, in my family, Lord God, in my neighbors, in my co-workers, in people I've not as met as yet, whatever you got in mind. We just want to see the works of the Lord. We just want you to move. We want you to, we want you to be God. And we want to let you be what you want to be and do what you want to do. Start in me. Start in my family. Start in my world. Work in this church mightily.